Here's a tip on how to answer one of the most commonly asked questions on the digital SAT reading section. If you take a look at the prompt, it states which choice completes the text with the most logical and precise word or phrase. What I recommend doing when you see a question with that type of prompt is start by reading from the beginning, and then once you get to this blank right here, fill it in with what you think should go there. Now, that might require that you continue reading on, but ultimately what your goal should be is to fill in the blank with a word before you actually take a look at your answer choices. This is important because it will help you avoid being swayed by what the answer choices say. So let's go ahead and illustrate this with question one. Former astronaut Ellen Ochoa says that although she doesn't have a definite idea of when it might happen, she blanked that humans will someday need to be able to live in other environments than those found on Earth. This conjecture informs her interest in future research miss missions to the moon. Okay, well, if she has interest in future research missions to the moon, I would assume that she believes that someday humans would need to be able to live in other environments than those found on Earth. Okay, so I would fill in right here with believes. Now, at this point, I would then take a look at my answer choices. So I have answer choice A as an option, which is it demands. Well, we can't say that she demands humans will someday need to be able to live in other environments because obviously she cannot demand that. We have B speculates. She speculates that humans will someday need to be able to live in other environments than those found on Earth. And that would make sense because it informs her interest in future research missions to the moon. Okay, so that makes a ton of sense. If we take a look at C, doubts. Well, she obviously doesn't doubt it because she's interested in future research missions to the moon and she cannot establish it. To establish something would basically be to prove something. She She's unable to prove that humans will someday need to be able to live in other environments than those found on Earth. Okay, so our answer would have to be B, speculates. And as you can see, by filling in this blank with a word before we actually take a look at our answer choices, we're much less likely to be swayed by what they say because we already know what should fill in that blank based on the context of the question. Here's another example with question two. Beginning in the 1950s, Navajo Nation legislator Annie Dodge Wanaka continuously worked to promote public health. This blank effort involved traveling throughout the vast Navajo homeland and writing a medical dictionary for speakers of Dain Bizad, the Navajo language. All right, I would say this consistent effort. Okay, We say that she continuously worked to promote public health. Then we go on to talk about her effort, which involved traveling throughout uh, the homeland, writing a medical dictionary. So obviously, this is a consistent effort. So that's what I'd fill in there before taking a look at my answer choices. Now, if we take a look at our options, we have A, impartial. Well, there's not any sides to be taken here. So you can't have a neutral stance on something that doesn't have two sides. So that would make sense. We have B, offhand. Offhand would have a negative connotation. So that would make sense here either. If we take a look at C, persistent, okay, persistent and consistent, very, very similar in meaning, okay, both in this context would basically mean that there is a consistent or um, continued effort involved um, by Annie. Okay, so that would make a lot of sense. If we take a look at D, mandatory, no one is forcing her to do that, so that wouldn't make sense. Okay, so our answer would be C. Here's how I recommend you approach digital SAT reading questions that ask you to state the main purpose or the main idea of text. So to illustrate this, I'm going to use question number seven. In 2007, computer scientist Louis Van An was working on converting printed books into a digital format. He found that some words were distorted enough that digital scanners couldn't recognize them, but most humans could easily read them. Based on that finding, Van An invented a simple security test to keep automated bots out of websites. The first version of the recapture test asked users to type one known word and one of the many words scanners couldn't recognize. Correct answers proved the users were human and added data to the book digitizing project. So for main purpose and main idea questions, what I recommend you do is come up with your own answer before taking a look at the answer choices. That way you're not easily swayed by answer choices that are close to correct, but have slight flaws in them that actually make them incorrect. So let's go ahead and start by coming up with our main purpose for this prompt. Okay, so ultimately we start out by talking about how um, Von An was using digital scanners and how it couldn't recognize some of the words. Then we talk about how he uses this to create the recapture test. And then we talk about the application of the recapture test and how it's used to protect websites. So ultimately it's really about the creation of the recapture test. Okay, so let's take a look at our options now that we've just identified the main purpose as the creation of the recapture test. So we have option A to discuss Von An's invention of recapture. Okay, that looks perfect. We'll put a check by that. Let's take a look at B, C, and D. We have B to explain how digital scanners work. Okay, obviously that's not the main purpose. Okay, we don't even really discuss necessarily that much about digital, uh, how digital scanners actually work. We just mention them in the beginning and talk about how they can't actually recognize some of the words. But that's really just to introduce how they came up with the recapture test. So just to lead us to the creation of it. We have C to call attention to Von An's book digitizing project. The focus isn't on his book digitizing project. Okay, that's just how he ended up discovering or creating recapture. Okay, so we can get rid of C as well there. If we take a look at D, we have to indicate how popular recapture is. Okay, once again, that is not um, ultimately the main purpose. Now, do we state anywhere even that it is popular? Okay, we say that uh, if we go up, he invented a simple security test to keep automated bots on websites. So we don't even necessarily mention that it is popular. Now, some of us may know this from just our general knowledge of what goes on on the internet, but we have to acknowledge that the main purpose here is talking about the creation of recapture. Okay, so our answer has to be A. Now, you'll notice by coming up with our own answer for the main purpose first, it helped us to be able to eliminate 
answer choices that were similar or were mentioned at somewhere in the text, but weren't actually the main purpose, but were just maybe a step to get us to the main purpose. Here's another example of how I recommend approaching questions that ask you about the main purpose or main idea on the digital SAT reading section. So I'm going to illustrate this with question 11. The following text is from Maggie Pogue Johnson's 1910 poem, Poet of Our Race. In this poem, the speaker is addressing Paul Lawrence Dunbar, a black author. Thou, with stroke of mighty pen, hast told of joy and mirth, and read the hearts and souls of men as cradled from their birth. The language of the flowers, thou hast rest them all, and e'en the little brook responded to thy call. Okay, so we're going to start out by coming up with our own main purpose before actually taking a look at your answer choices. That way we're not as swayed by answer choices that are close to correct, but have slight flaws that actually make them incorrect. So... Let's go ahead and start by discussing what the main purpose of this is. Let's start with this first part, okay? So we have, thou with stroke of mighty pen has told of joy and mirth and read the hearts and souls of men as cradled from their birth, okay? So we're ultimately complimenting um, Paul Lawrence Dunbar's work as a poet, stating that he's told of joy and mirth, read the hearts and souls of men. So essentially stating that um, he's very in tune with obviously the souls of men, or in other words, um, the soul really representing you know, the inner thoughts of people, sort of who they are deep, deep down in their soul. We have as cradled from their birth. So from, um, from their birth, uh, presumably until death. And we take a look at the second part. We have the language of the flowers. Thou hast read them all and in the little brook responded to thy call. Okay. So here we're talking more so about nature. Okay. So presumably this is a poet who is talking both about uh, humans and nature. Um, clearly it sounds like they are very in tune with both of them. Okay. Has read them all, all the language of the flowers. So very great at writing um, both about humans and about nature. Okay. So main purpose I would say is that Paul Lawrence Dunbar is an incredible poet who is great at writing both about um, humans, maybe the human experience as well as nature. So we have option A to praise a certain writer for being especially perceptive regarding people in nature. Okay, as you can see, that's very supported by the text. Okay, that's also in line with the main purpose that we came up with before taking a look at the answer choices. So that looks really good. We'll take a quick look at B, C, and D as well. We have B to establish that a certain writer has read extensively about a variety of topics. Well, that's not the main purpose. Okay, and we're also not explicitly stating, or there's no real support for that the certain writer has read extensively about a variety of topics, okay? This is pretty much all figurative language if we scroll up and take a look at the poem. So there's really not any support for that being the main purpose. Um, ultimately, the main purpose is that um, they are especially perspective regarding people in nature, right? We talk about how um, they have told of joy and mirth, read the hearts and souls of men, and that's really the key part there, read hearts and souls of men, okay? So that's perceptive about people and then perceptive about nature, the language of the flowers, thou hast read them all. Okay, so tons of support for A. If we take a look at C, to call attention to a certain writer's careful and elaborate, elaborately detailed writing process. We're not discussing the writing process. Okay, if we take a look at D, we've got uh, to recount fond memories of an afternoon spent in nature with a certain writer. Okay, we never state that this is from an afternoon they spent together. Okay, so D doesn't have any support. Our answer there would have to be A. As you can see, coming up with our own answer choice first help us to avoid getting stuck between two answers. And it also helps us to get rid of answer choices that seem like they would be close to a correct answer, but have slight flaws that we ultimately can then use to rule them out as incorrect. Here's some advice on how to answer this really common digital SAT reading question. The question states, which choice best describes the function of the underlying sentence as a whole? When you come across a question like this, the first thing that I'd recommend doing is going ahead and reading through. So let's go ahead and start doing that with question eight. The following text is from Edith Wharton's 1905 novel, The House of Mirth. Lily Barton and a companion are walking through a park. Lily had no real intimacy with nature, but she had a passion for the appropriate and could be keenly sensitive to a scene which was fitting, which, which was the fitting background of her own sensations. The landscape outspread below her seemed an enlargement of her present mood, and she found something of herself in its calmness, its breadth, its long reaches. Okay, so immediately what I'm seeing is before we had a claim, okay, that she could be keenly sensitive to a scene, which was the fitting background of her own sensations. Okay, now we are going ahead and showing or proving that claim. Okay, we have the landscape outspread below her, it seemed an enlargement of her present mood, and she found something of herself in its calmness. Okay, that's very directly supportive of that claim that we had in the previous sentence. Okay, that she finds something of herself in its calmness, or in other words, that it's fitting. Um, she's keenly sensitive to a scene which was the fitting background of her own sensations. Okay, so obviously that's supportive. It's breadth, it's long, free reaches. All right, let's keep reading on. On the nearer slopes, the sugar maples wavered like pyres of light. Lower down was a massive massing of great orchards, and here and there, the lingering of an oak grove. All right, so this is pretty much from here down, just a description of the setting for the most part. So we have 
which choice best describes the function of the underlying sentence if in the text as a whole. So from here, I'd go down to my answer choices. So if option A, it creates a detailed image of the physical setting of the scene. Well, it looks like actually the sentence after the underlined one is what is really giving more of a detailed image of the physical setting of the scene. Okay, so I would go ahead and I would get rid of A. If we take a look back at the sentence that is underlined, and I'll go ahead and remove some of this blue so you can see it a little bit better. Okay, we state that the landscape outspread below her seemed an enlargement of her present mood, and she found something of herself in its calmness, its breadth, its long for it reaches. As you can see, that's really not creating a detailed image of the physical setting. Okay, so we could remove it based on that. And one thing I do recommend you do on the SAT reading and writing section is you can cross out answer choices, okay, and you can cross them out based on what makes them false or what makes them incorrect. Okay, so if we take a look at B now, it establishes that a character is experiencing an internal conflict. Okay, well, ultimately it's not really establishing that the character is experiencing an internal conflict. Okay, if we go back up to the underlying sentence, it says, the landscape outspread below her seemed an enlargement of her present mood and she found something of herself in its calmness, its breath, its long for the reaches. Well, here we have, it found she found something of herself in its calmness. Okay, so it doesn't sound like there's much internal conflict there. Okay, it sounds like she would be calm, so we could get rid of B. If we take a look at C, we have, it makes an assertion that the next sentence expands on. Okay, well, the next sentence is really just a description of the scene, of the setting. Okay, so ultimately we're not making an assertion, okay? And the next sentence is, would obviously not be expanding on that. If we take a look at D now, we have it illustrates an idea that is introduced in the previous sentence. Okay, if we go back up in the previous sentence, as I pointed out earlier, it states that she could be keenly sensitive to a scene which was the fitting background of her own sensations. Okay, we then go on to state that she found something of herself in its calmness, its breadth, its long for reaches. Okay, and the landscape outspread below her seemed an enlargement of her present mood. Okay, that's ultimately supportive of the claim that came before it. Okay, so as we can see there, our answer would have to be D. Okay, so I think the key things that I want you to take away from this tip is basically if you have an underlying sentence like this, okay, be looking for the role that it plays as you read through. Here's something you need to watch out for on one of the most commonly asked questions on the digital SAT reading section. That question is which choice best states the function of the underlying sentence and the overall structure of the text. So I'm going to approach this just like I approached the previous question, but then once we get to the answer choices, I'm going to show you some common wrong answer choices to watch out for. So we have a study by a team including finance professor Madhu V suggests that exposure to sunshine during the workday can lead to overly optimistic behavior using data spanning from 1994 to 2010 for a set of US companies. The team compared over 29,000 annual earnings forecasts to the actual earnings later reported by those companies. All right, so ultimately we see that we start out here with a suggestion or sort of a hypothesis that exposure to sunshine during the workday can lead to overly optimistic behavior. Then we talk about how we are gathering the data. Okay, so right here we have data collection. Then we have the team found that the greater the exposure to sunshine at work in the two weeks before managers submitted an earnings forecast, the more the, com the manager's forecast exceeded what the company actually earned that year. So then we have summary. Okay, so we start with hypothesis, data collection, summary. All right, so ultimately, if we scroll down, we've got option A to summarize the result of the team's analysis. Well, that would be the summary, okay? And this is one of the common wrong answer choices that I wanted to point out to you guys, is that oftentimes when you have a sentence underlined like this in the text, one of the answer choices, which is obviously gonna be a wrong answer choice, is they will select either the sentence before or the sentence after or another sentence somewhere in the text, okay? And they will put that down as one of the wrong answer choices. So you need to watch out for that. In this case, it's the summary, which we see is the sentence that is after the sentence that's underlined. Okay, so we can get rid of A because we know it's not the underlined sentence that's giving the summary, it is the following sentence. So always watch out for that. If we take a look at B, we have to present a specific example that illustrates the study's findings. So this is more so of a misinterpretation, okay? So I would identify this as a misinterpretation wrong answer choice. And the reason I identify it as that is because some people would look at this underlined text and they would think that it is a specific example illustrating the study's findings, but it's not, okay? They're talking about how they are collecting this data, okay? This is not a specific example either because ultimately, okay, we're looking at 29,000 annual earnings forecasts. So obviously that is not specific, okay? Also, we have to recognize that this is data collection, okay? This is not providing of an example. We are collecting the data. Okay, so if we look at option B, we can get rid of it. Okay, we would classify that, in my opinion, as a misinterpretation because this is not a specific example. If we take a look at C, we have to explain part of the methodology used in the team study. Okay, oftentimes on the SAT, if you see methodology, you should probably be thinking how the experiment or the study is being um, set up and how data is being collected. Okay, so that's what you want to think about when you think about methodology. And as you can see, in this case, that underlying sentence Okay, that's describing the methodology used. Okay, they used data spanning from 1994 to 2010 for a set of US companies. 
The team compared over 29,000 annual earnings forecasts to the actual earnings later reported by those companies. Okay, that's an example of a methodology. Okay, so C is perfect there. We'll take a look at D as well. Okay, D states to call out a challenge the team faced in conducting its analysis. The way I would classify answer choice D is just as a random wrong answer choice. Sometimes on the SAT reading section, and this isn't specific to just this question type, this is specific to just generally almost any type of question on the SAT reading and writing section. You may just get some answer choices that are fairly random, and this one is fairly random. There really isn't any challenge that's discussed at all in the text anywhere. Okay, so the fact that they would put that there is really just random. Okay, so we can get rid of D as well there. As you can see, your answer there will be C. What I really wanted to point out in this is the common wrong answer choices that you will see on questions that ask you to state the function of underlying sentences in the overall structure of text. Here's a tip for anyone who struggles with reading comprehension on the digital SAT reading and writing section. If we take a look at question 10, we'll start by reading the question, which states, according to the text, what is true about mother? We have the following text is adapted from Edith Nesbitt's 1906 novel, The Railway Children. Mother did not spend all her time in paying dull visits to dull ladies and sitting dully at home waiting for dull lazies to pay visits to her. She was almost always there, ready to play with the children and read to them and help them to do their home lessons. Besides this, she used to write stories for them while they were at school and read aloud to the, and read aloud, read them aloud after tea. And she always made up funny pieces of poetry for their birthdays and for other great occasions. Okay, so in this case, on a reading comprehension question like this, you really just have to go to your answer choices. There's not much you can do before that. Okay, so we'll go ahead and go to answer choice A. We have, she wishes that more ladies would visit her. So the biggest tip that I would have for anyone who struggles with reading comprehension on the digital SAT and the SAT in general is you need to try to make it less about comprehension and more about evidence and textual support. Okay, so if you take a look at option A, she wishes that more ladies would visit her, okay? The biggest tool you have if you are someone who struggles with reading comprehension is the ability to go back to the text. Okay, so she wishes more ladies would visit her. Let's see if there's any textual evidence for that, because if there's not, we can get rid of it. So we have mother did not spend all her time in paying dull visits to dull ladies and sitting dully at home waiting for dull ladies to pay visits to her. She was almost always there ready to play with the children, read to them, and then we talk about the children for the rest of this. Okay, ultimately, is there any evidence that she wishes that more ladies would visit her? No, there is not. So you can get rid of A. Okay, and one piece of advice for the reading and writing section is when you get rid of an answer choice, try to get rid of um, it based on the part of it that's false. So she wishes that more ladies would visit her. Okay, there's no evidence that she wishes that. Okay, you would have to make, um, you can't even make a reach for that. There's not, it's not even like it would be a large reach. There's just no textual evidence to support it. So you have to get rid of A. Okay, if you take a look at B now, birthdays are her favorite special occasion. And this is where being strict on the digital SAT reading section is important. Okay, you wanna be strict. This part right here, birthdays are her favorite special occasion. That's what makes B wrong, okay? And let's say you didn't remember um, that she never stated this. Well, you can go back to the text and you can look for special occasions. So let's go ahead and take a look for that, or birthdays in particular. Okay, so if we go back to the text, we'll look for birthdays. Okay, we see right here is the only mention of birthdays. So we have, she always made up funny pieces of poetry for their birthdays and for other great occasions. Okay, great occasions does not mean it's her favorite. Okay, so on the SAT reading section, be strict when getting rid of answer choices. If it states that it's someone's favorite special occasion, but it just states that uh, it's a great occasion in the text, you can't make that jump. There's not textual evidence to support that it's their favorite, okay? Now, if we take a look at C, we have she creates stories and poems for her children. Well, let's see if we have evidence for that, okay? If you're not someone who's great with comprehension, go back to the text. So it creates stories and poems for children. Well, let's take a look there. We have she was almost always there, ready to play with the children, read to them, and help them do their home lessons. Besides this, she used to write stories, okay? So we have that she creates stories for them. And while they were at school and read them aloud after tea, and she always made up funny pieces of poetry, okay? So she made up funny pieces of poetry. Made up means that she's writing them or creating them, okay? So she creates stories and poems for her children. We see that that has textual support. C would have to be our answer, okay? And then D, reading to her children is her favorite activity. Well, once again, there's no mention of anything being her favorite activity. Let's say that you um, forgot that. You're not great at comprehension. You just go back to the text. Look for where we talk about reading to her children then. Okay, we have that up here. She was almost always there, ready to play with the children and read to them and help them do their home lessons. Okay, and then after that, if we go down, okay, it doesn't really look like we're talking about, um, we talk about reading again here, read to them a lot after tea, but once again, we don't say that it's her favorite. Okay, so we can get rid of that by being strict on the favorite part. Okay, so if you are someone who struggles with comp comprehension, try to identify the subject in your answer choice, identify where that subject is in the text, okay, read that section of the text, and then determine if there is textual evidence to support it. If there is not any evidence to support it, then it cannot be correct, okay? Every answer choice on the SAT has to have evidence from the text to support it. Here's a tip for anyone who struggles with reading comprehension on the digital SAT reading and writing section. What I recommend doing is taking a look at your prompt 
before you end up reading through the passage. And do this each time because then you know what to look for as you read through and it avoids you having to do a second read through, which if you struggle with reading comprehension, you probably would have to. Okay, so based on the text, how does Lord Chancellor respond to the crowd? So we're ultimately gonna be looking for Lord Chancellor's response to the crowd as we do our initial read through. So let's go ahead and start. We have the following text is adapted from Louis Carroll's 1889 satirical novel, Sylvie and Bruno. A crowd is gathered outside a room belonging to the warden, an official who represents the Lord Chancellor, or who reports to the Lord Chancellor. One man who was more that more excited than the rest flung his hat high into the air and shouted as well as i could make out who roared for the subwarden everybody roared but whether it was for the subwarden or not it did not clearly appear some were shouting bread and some taxes but no one seemed to know what it was they really wanted all this i saw from the open window of the warden's breakfast saloon looking across the shoulder of lord chancellor what can it all mean he kept repeating to himself i never heard such shouting before and at this time of the morning too and with such unanimity okay so we have his response contained right here okay he states that what can it all mean Okay, he kept repeating to himself, he's never heard such shouting at this time in the morning. So he doesn't know what it means, okay? But then he ends with, and with such unanimity, or in other words, such togetherness or closeness. Okay, so everyone's together, but Lord Chancellor can't make out what they all want. All right, so that's his response. We've got option A. He asks about the meaning of the crowd's shouting, even though he claims to know what the crowd wants. Well, he doesn't claim to know what the crowd wants, okay? So anytime you have an answer choice on the SAT reading or writing section that you can get rid of based on a piece of it that is incorrect, cross out that piece that makes it incorrect and move on. You got B, he indicates a desire to speak to the crowd. Okay, it never has any sort of portion in the text that indicates he has a desire to speak to the crowd. Okay, if you didn't remember that, for example, if you have bad reading comprehension, you would go back to where the response is contained, okay, which we see is in this bracket of blue right here. If you take a look there, you see, what can it all mean? He kept repeating himself, I never heard such shouting before and at this time of the morning too and with such unanimity. Obviously right there, there is no indication he wants to speak to the crowd. So you could get rid of B. And then C, he expresses a sympathy for the crowd's demands. Okay, well, does it ever show that he's expressing sympathy for the crowd's demands? Once again, it does not. Okay, so you would get rid of that. Okay, if you weren't sure on that, you would go back to that section. And notice how I've narrowed this down to a section. So if you are someone who struggles reading comprehension, make sure that you try to narrow down where you need to look back to. Okay, sometimes it'll be in a case like this where you're only looking at one portion of the text, which is his response, because you really don't need to focus on the other portions because you're not asked about them. Okay, in other cases, you may have to jump around a little bit more because it may not be confined to one section of the text. Okay, and now we'll take a look at answer choice D. He describes the crowd as being united. That's supported. He talks about, um, and with such unanimity would be the quotation that would support that, even though the crowd clearly appears otherwise. Okay, and then let's say that you weren't sure if the crowd clearly appears otherwise. Okay, that's actually not contained within this small section. It's not confined there. Okay, that one to find support for you'd actually have to go up. Okay, so the crowd appears otherwise. Everybody roared, but whether it was for the subordinate or not, it did not clearly appear. Some were shouting bread, others taxes. No one seemed to know what they really wanted. Okay, so that would show that the crowd appears otherwise, even though he describes the crowd as being united. Okay, so answer D has a ton of textual support there. Here's how I recommend that you approach questions on the digital SAT reading and writing section that asks you to support or weaken any sort of claim or hypothesis. I'm gonna illustrate this with question 13. Question 13's prompt states, which finding, if true, would most directly support the student's claim? In order to answer a question like this, you will need to identify the hypothesis or claim, in this case, a claim. So let's go ahead and start by reading through question 13. And when you go through, you wanna identify that claim. So we'll mark it with a C when we find it. We were born in 1891 to a Kiwicha speaking family in the Andes Mountains of Peru. Martin Chambi is today considered to be one of the most renowned figures of Latin American photography. In a paper for an art history class, a student claims, so this is very, very clear, can we mark it with a C, that Chambi's photographs have considerable ethnographic value. In his work, Chambi was able to capture diverse elements of Peruvian society, representing his subjects with both dignity and authenticity. So now we'll go ahead and take a look at our options. We have option A. Chambi took many commissioned photographs of wealthy Peruvians, but he also produced hundreds of images carefully documenting the people's sites and customs of indigenous communities of the Andes. Well, that's ultimately supporting the fact that his photographs have considerable ethnographic value and his work, he's capturing diverse elements, okay, so both the wealthy and the indigenous communities of Peruvian society, representing his subjects with both dignity and authenticity. Okay, we have, he's documenting the peoples, the sites, the customs, okay, so that would be supportive of the authenticity aspect. Okay, as far as the dignity aspect, the fact that he's taking you know hundreds of images carefully documenting um, the indigenous communities of the Andes, okay, I'd say that because he's in particular documenting the indigenous communities as well as the wealthy Peruvians, but in this case, I'm more so concerned with the indigenous communities, the fact that he's documenting both of those, okay, is showing that he's showing them with dignity, okay, there's no sort of bashing or, or anything like that, okay, he's both 
um, you know, taking these portraits of wealthy as well as the poor with no sort of partiality to either. So he's representing them with dignity, authenticity. Um, because of that, has considerable ethnographic value. Ethnographic value. Okay, so that looks good. We'll take a look at B, C, and D as well. We have option B. Chambi's photographs demonstrate a high level of technical skill as seen in his strategic use of illumination to create dramatic light and shadow contrast. Now that they may very well be true. However, the problem is we need to directly support the student's claim. And the student's claim isn't that Chambi is the most technically skilled photographer. Okay, so we wouldn't want to focus on his technical skill. We'd want to focus on the ethnographic value of the photographs he is taking. Okay, the fact that he's capturing diverse elements of Peruvian society, not on the actual technical skill. So this is an example of something that is fairly unrelated to the actual claim that is being made here. If we take a look at C, we have during his lifetime, Chambi was known and celebrated both within and outside his native Peru as his work was published in places like Argentina, Spain, and Mexico. So this answer choice, I would ask, actually classify it as you would select this if you had a misinterpretation of part of the text. Because if we scroll up, when we state that Chambi's photographs have considerable ethnographic value, we're not stating that um, Chambi himself and him as a photographer is being valued in multiple aspects or parts of the world, okay, which is what answer choice C is trying to sort of, that's kind of the claim C is insinuating with its support here, okay, saying that Chambi is known and celebrated within and outside his native Peru as work was published in places like Argentina, Spain, and Mexico. So I'd classify this as a misinterpretation type of wrong answer choice. If we take a look at D, we have some of the peoples and places Chambi photographed had long been popular subjects for Peruvian photographers. Well, once again, we need to keep in mind the claim that we're trying to support, okay? We know that the claim is that his photographs have considerable ethnographic value and his work he's capturing diverse elements of Peruvian society representing his subjects with both dignity and authenticity, okay? No part of D is ultimately supportive of that. Okay, D is really just stating something. It's just stating that some of the peoples and places Jamie photo photographed had been long popular subjects for Peruvian photographers. That's not supportive of the claim, okay? And also, one thing I also wanna point out here is you need to directly support the claim. The word directly there is important, okay? Because you have to keep in mind your answer choice must directly support. It can't just be um, you know, some sort of tangent that is a reach to support. It needs to directly support. And the only answer choice that does that here is answer choice A. So the big takeaway I want you to have from this type of question is, as you read through, identify that claim or that hypothesis that you either need to support or weaken. Here are some common wrong answer choice types to questions that ask you about findings that either support or weaken a researcher's hypothesis or someone's claim. Okay, so I'm gonna illustrate this with question number 16. So to start, we're gonna first identify what the researcher's hypothesis is as we do our read through on question 16, and then we'll get into the answer choices. So we have in the mountains of Brazil, B, T, and B, M, two plants in the Velocio family establish themselves on soilless, nutrient poor patches of quartzite rock. Plant ecologist Anna A and Patricio de Brito Costa used microscopic analysis to determine that the roots of BT and BM, which grow directly into the quartzite, have clusters of fine hairs near the root tip. Further analysis indicated that these hairs secrete both malic and citric acids. The researchers hypothesized, so now we have our hypothesis, I'm gonna mark this with an H, that the plants depend on dissolving underlying rock with these acids, as the process not only creates channels for continued growth, but also releases phosphates that provide the vital nutrient, phosphorus. Okay, so now we have to find support for that hypothesis. I'll try to leave that hypothesis within the frame so you can still see it. We have option A, other species in the Velocii family are found in terrains with more soil, but have root structures similar to BT and BM. Okay, ultimately, this is pretty unrelated to the actual hypothesis at hand here. Okay, our hypothesis is that the uh, plants depend on dissolving underlying rock with these acids um, because that they then use this to release phosphates that provide the vital nutrient phosphorus. Well, if you have the same family, there are other um, other species in the same family that have root structures that are similar but are found in terrains with more soil. That's not really telling us any support or not weakening either the claim that the um, these plants are ultimately using these acids to not only create channels for continued growth, but also to release phosphates to provide the vitamin nutrient phosphorus. So this really doesn't weaken, it doesn't support either. Um, it's, it's for the most part unrelated. So we can get rid of A based on that. So that would fit into sort of um, the neutral or unrelated category for the most part. If we take a look at B, we have though B, T, and B, M both secrete citric and malic acids. Each species produces these acids in different proportions. Okay, this right here, it's not supportive of our hypothesis. It's not weakening our hypothesis. It's just neutral and unrelated. So it fits into pretty much the same bucket as answer choice A would there. Okay, if we take a look at option C now, we have the roots of B, T, and B, M carve new entry points into rocks, even when cracks in the surface are readily available. All right, well, if we go back up to our hypothesis, 
Okay. We know that if these roots are, or these cracks are already available, readily available, we would expect that if they didn't need the phosphorus, they would just grow into the cracks. Okay. Because they wouldn't need and to ultimately create these new cracks, which is more costly and requires more energy from the actual plant itself to make these new cracks. Okay. So this is actually supportive of that hypothesis, right? Because if they were to just take the cracks that were already entered and not create new ones, then that would support the idea that, or that would weaken the hypothesis and support the idea that they don't actually need the phosphorus. But because they are actively carving new entry points into the rocks, even though the cracks are already available and they're not just growing into the cracks, this supports the idea that they would need to do that in order to get the phosphorus. Okay, so we know our answer there is going to have to be C. We can take a look at D as well because uh, let's see what wrong answer choice bucket that falls into so I can teach that. We have BT and BM thrive even when transferred to the surfaces of rocks that do not contain phosphates. Well, if they're thriving on rocks that don't contain phosphates, that would weaken our hypothesis that BT and BM need to get phosphorus from these rocks by carving in these new entry points. Okay, so if they're thriving without phosphorus, then that would weaken that hypothesis. Okay, so D would fall into the bucket of being the opposite of what we need. So the opposite in this example would be something that weakens our hypothesis. Now, if our question was what would most directly weaken the hypothesis, then D would be right and C would actually be the opposite. Okay, so I wanted to point out those wrong answer choice types on questions that are asking you to support or weaken a hypothesis or a claim. Here's one of the biggest things you need to watch out for on the digital SAT reading section when asked to logically complete text. So the way I would approach question 17 is I'd start by taking a look at the prompt. In this case, we just got which choice logically completes the text. Then I'll go back up and I'll start reading. So we have herbivorous sauropod dinosaurs could grow more than 100 feet long and weigh up to 80 tons. And some researchers have attributed the evolution of sauropods to such massive sizes to increase plant production resulting from high levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide during the Mesozoic era. In this case, we have researchers attributing something, so I'll mark that with an A. So any sort of hypothesis, claim, attribution along those lines or speculation, I will mark with a letter, in this case A for attribution, and then I'll keep reading. However, there is no evidence of significant spikes in carbon dioxide levels coinciding with relevant periods in sauropod evolution, such as when the first large sauropods appear, when several sauropod lineages underwent further evolution toward gigantism, or when sauropods reached their maximum known sizes, suggesting that blank. Okay, well, as you can see, we have a contrast here, and then we go on to describe that there's no evidence for the attribution. So I've got no evidence. I'm going to underline that. I'll draw the arrow back to attributions. We know that there's no evidence for that. All right, suggesting that what? We have option A, fluctuations in atmospheric carbon dioxide affected different sauropod lineages differently. Well, once again, we have no evidence for fluctuations in atmospheric carbon dioxide. Okay, so no evidence for these fluctuations, so I can get rid of A. We can go and move on to B. We have the evolution of larger body sizes in sauropods did not depend on increased atmospheric carbon dioxide. Okay, we know that in our attribution, we thought that it did depend or at least coincide with this increase increased plant production resulting from high levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide, but we know there's no evidence of significant spikes in carbon dioxide levels. Okay, so we would state then that the evolution of larger body sizes did not depend on increased atmospheric carbon dioxide. Okay, so there's evidence to support that. So we can go ahead and mark B as our answer. I'm going to quickly go over C and D as well, and we can discuss which box of wrong answer choice they fit into, because there are common types of wrong answer choices on the digital SAT reading section. So here we have C, atmospheric carbon dioxide was higher when the largest known sauropods live than when it was than it was when the first sauropods appeared. Well, once again, if we go back up, we state that there's no evidence of significant spikes in carbon dioxide levels coinciding with relevant periods in sauropod evolution. Okay, so there is no support for that spike. Okay, so we can get rid of this based on this part here, that atmospheric carbon dioxide was higher when the largest known sauropods lived. Okay, we don't know that, so we can get rid of C. If we take a look at D now, we have sauropods probably would not have evolved to such immense sizes if atmospheric carbon dioxide had been even slightly higher. So there's a few things wrong with this. Okay, for one, this isn't even supportive of the hypothesis or the attribution. Okay, so it's not even supportive of that. We know the attribution's wrong. Okay, we also know that we never state that sauropods could not have evolved uh, to such immense sizes if atmospheric carbon dioxide had been even slightly higher. So there's no evidence for this. Okay, so we can go ahead and get rid of it based on the fact that there just is no evidence. Okay, so our answer would have to be B. So what I want you to take away from this is a couple things. For one, on this question type, which is a fairly common one, which choice logically completes the text. I want you to mark any claims, hypothesis, attributions, conclusions, things along those lines. I want you to mark them with their coinciding letter um, or underline them, whatever marking you use is up to you. Okay, the next thing is you want to be 
deliberate about going back to the text, okay? Because oftentimes, you saw as we went through these answer choices, you'll need to go back to see what logically makes sense. And that's especially true for science texts like this, okay? This is ultimately a science passage, okay? For science-based passages, you will very often need to go back to the text, okay? Find what evidence there is to support what's coming after or what's completing the text. Here's a second example of how I recommend approaching questions that ask you to logically complete text on the digital SAT reading section. So I'll illustrate this with question 18. In documents called judicial opinions, judges explain the reasoning behind their legal rulings and in those explanations, they sometimes cite and discuss historical and contemporary philosophers. Legal scholar and philosopher Anita L. Allen argues that while judges are naturally inclined to mention philosophers whose views align with their own positions, the strongest judicial opinions consider and rebut potential objections. And I'm going to mark this with a claim. Okay, it says she's arguing this, so you could mark it with an A, you can mark it with a C. I guess in this case, actually, I'll mark it with an A for argues. So this is her argument. Okay, discussing philosophers whose views conflict with the judge's views could therefore what? Okay, so we have discussing philosophers whose views who conflict with the judge's views could. Okay, well, we know that her argument is that while judges are naturally inclined to mention philosophers whose views align with their own positions, the strongest judicial opinions consider and rebut potential objections. Okay, so discussing philosophers whose views conflict with judges' views, she would argue would therefore strengthen their arguments. Okay, so we have option A, allow judges to craft judicial opinions without needing to consult philosophical works. Well, it's actually the opposite, okay? It would force judges to craft judicial opinions with, instead of without, with needing to consult philosophical works, since they would have to consult works that they're not familiar with or ones that they disagree with. So they would need to consult them. So we can get rid of A. Okay, A essentially has sort of the incorrect relationship in terms of with versus without. Okay, let's go and take a look at B now. We have helped judges improve the arguments that they put forward in their judicial opinions. Well, we know that that is her argument. Her argument is that the strongest judicial opinions consider and rebut potential objections. Therefore, discussing philosophers whose views conflict with judges' views could therefore improve the arguments that they put forward in their judicial opinions. Okay, so this is ultimately going in line with what she is arguing. Okay, so our answer there would have to be B. I'm going to take a look at C and D as well. So we can teach a little bit based on those. We have C, make judicial opinions more comprehensible to readers without legal or philosophical training. Well, we never discuss legal or philosophical training or the comprehensibility to readers. That's not the goal of this. The goal isn't um, in discussing with conflicting philosophers' views. The goal isn't to make it more comprehensible to the readers. The goal is to make it a stronger argument. Okay, so this would be trying to achieve a separate goal or a different goal from what is actually stated by Anita L. Allen. Okay, so this would be if you were not, um, if you misinterpreted basically the argument that she's trying to make or the goal behind this. If we look at D, we have bring judicial opinions in line with views that are broadly held among philosophers. Well, for one thing, philosophers hold many different views. Okay, so that wouldn't really make a ton of sense. But also, the goal isn't to bring the judicial opinions in line with the views of philosophers. The goal is just to strengthen the argument. This all goes back to understanding and identifying Anita L. Allen's argument. Okay, her argument, once again, I will go back up, is that well, judges are naturally inclined to mention philosophers whose views align with their own positions, the strongest judicial opinions consider and rebut potential objections. And then when we go on, we know that we're specifically looking at, and I'm going to underline this again, we're specifically looking at this section, the strongest judicial opinions consider and rebut potential objections. We know we're looking specifically at that because we state that discussing philosophers whose views conflict with judges' views could therefore do what? Okay, and since we're talking about how to, um, since we're talking about views that conflict with the judges, okay, that's the potential objections that I underlined here. So it would have to be that it makes the judicial opinion stronger in order to continue this idea. Okay, so our answer there has to be B as far as what I want you to take away from this. A couple things. I talked about this in the last question I went over that dealt with completing the text, but you want to make sure that you're marking any arguments, claims, hypotheses, conclusions with a letter or some sort of other marking so that you know how to go back to that in the text. The other thing is if you can, I talked about this in a question type that was different than completing the text, but you want to make sure you're understanding where to go back to. Okay. So in this case, you saw that we really, really focused in on the strongest judicial opinions, consider and rebut potential objections. Okay. And the reason is that that is what is directly discussed in this next part, discussing philosophers whose views conflict with judges' views. That is the potential objections. So as you can see, most of that text, pretty much the whole first half, 
we're really not very concerned with. So generally on the SAT reading section, and this is not specific just to this question type, if you can limit where you're going back to in the text to just where it is necessary in order to answer the question correctly, that will help you. There will be times when you need to you know, go through more of the text or maybe even all of the text when going through an answer choice. Um, and that's okay, that does happen. But on certain questions, you can keep the scope of text that you need to refer back to more limited, and that will help you save some time. Here's how I recommend you approach questions on the digital SAT reading section that ask you to fill in a quotation to effectively illustrate some sort of claim. Okay, so the first thing that I would do if I had just scrolled down to question 12 is I would identify, in this case, I need to effectively illustrate a claim. I would underline the fact that it's a claim. Okay, so I'm gonna mark my claim as I do this read through. So we have O Pioneers is a 1913 novel by Willa Cather. In the novel, Cather portrays Alexandra Bergson as having a deep emotional connection to her natural surroundings. Okay, the claim here is that Bergson has a deep emotional connection to her natural surroundings. So that's the claim. Okay, so now we just need to go A, B, C, D find one that supports that. So the question that you need to ask yourself after you read through each answer choice here is, does this support the claim? Okay, or does this illustrate the claim rather? Okay, illustrate, does it illustrate the claim? So let's go ahead and start with A. She had never she had never known before how much the country meant to her. Okay, so this is illustrating that she cares for the country. The chirping of the insects down in the long grass had been like the sweetest music. She had felt as if her heart were hiding down there. Okay, so it felt as if her heart were hiding down there somewhere with the quail and the plover and all the little wine, wild things that crooned or buzzed in the sun. Okay, so obviously she has an emotional connection here. feels her heart is hiding down there. Under the long shaggy ridges, she felt the future stirring. So clear that she has a deep emotional connection to nature from answer choice A. Okay, so obviously that is illustrating the claim. I'll quickly go over B, C, and D as well because it can be helpful to understand why wrong answer choices are wrong. So we have B, Alexandra talked about talked to the men about their crops and to the women about their poultry. She spent a whole day with one young farmer who had been away at school and who was experimenting with a new kind of clover hay. She learned a great deal. So some people might look at B and say, okay, it talks a ton about nature. That must be the answer, but it's not because we have to keep in mind the entirety of our claim. If we scroll up, we see our claim is that she has a deep emotional connection to her natural surroundings. Okay. Answer choice B, while it talks about nature, it does not show or illustrate that she has a deep emotional connection to nature. It is just talking about her um, sort of learning more about nature, okay, but not showing she has a deep emotional connection to it. I can learn about football. That doesn't mean I have a deep emotional connection to football. Okay, so that's that's why B would have to be wrong there. Okay, so understand that just because we talk about one of the topics mentioned in the claim does not mean we are illustrating the claim. If you look at C, we have Alexandra drove off alone. The rattle of her wagon was lost in the howling of the wind, but her lantern held firmly between her feet made a moving point of light along the highway going deeper and deeper into the dark country. Okay, once again, even though we are talking about going into the dark country, which can be pertained or could be you know thought of, as going deeper into possibly nature, if you were to associate country with nature, which is a pretty fair association. It does not support, once again, the fact that she has a deep emotional connection to her natural surroundings, okay? So you have to make sure that you are illustrating the entirety of the claim and not just talking about one of the topics of the claim, which would be nature in this case. If you look at D, we have, it was Alexandra who read the papers and followed the markets and who learned by the mistakes of their neighbors. It was Alexandra who could always tell you about what it had cost to fatten each steer and who could guess the weight of a hog before it went on the scale so closer than John Bergson, her father himself. Okay, so a couple things I wanna point on on this one, okay? First off, at the end here, when we talk about how she could guess the weight of a hog before it went on the scales closer than her father himself, that's probably indicating that she grew up close to nature, close probably on a farm, okay, since she's able to guess the weight of a hog better than her father is. So presumably she has done a lot of work on a farm. So that's kind of what that is indicating, but, I could, once again, kind of the same similar example to football, right? If I had worked on a farm for a long time, that does not necessarily mean I have a deep emotional connection to nature. It just means I've worked on a farm for a long time and probably know how much a hog weighs, okay? So you cannot associate that. That does not illustrate having a deep emotional connection with nature, okay? So that's the problem with D. So I think the key thing I want you to take away from um, this question and sort of this example is, number one, the way you approach this, identify what you need. Okay, in this case, you have to first identify the claims. We identify the claim. In this case, we need to illustrate that claim. So we go through A, B, C, and D, okay? Find which one illustrates that and recognize that we need to actually illustrate it. We cannot just mention or talk about the topic. Okay, in this case, it was nature, but it could be another topic. It's not enough just to discuss the topic or put the character in a setting where the topic is. 
you have to actually illustrate the entirety of the claim. Here's a second example of a question where you're asked to provide a quotation to effectively illustrate a claim. Okay, so this is very similar to the last question. In this case, we're dealing with a poem, however. There's also one other thing I wanna point out with this question, which is why I wanted to include it here. So we have question 12. To you is an 1856 poem by Walt Whitman, and the poem Whitman suggests that readers whom he addresses directly have not fully understood themselves. Writing, all right, well, first, let's go ahead and identify the claim. Okay, the claim is that the readers who he's addressing directly have not fully understood themselves. Yes, that's the claim. They have not fully understood themselves. Okay, now we gotta keep in mind this is a poem, so let's go and go through our options. Okay, we also need to understand that he's writing this poem directly to the reader. It's called To You, okay? So we need to understand the perspective of the reader. The perspective is he's addressing them directly, okay? And that's stated up here, that he's addressing them directly. So perspective is something you need to pay attention to on the SAT reading and writing section. So just recognize that. If you come across a poem, especially, you're gonna to wanna to be able to recognize perspective. Um, narratives as well, but in particular poems. Okay, so let's go ahead and look through our options. We have option A, you have not known what you are. You have slumbered upon yourself all your life. Your eyelids have been the same as closed most of the time. Okay, you have not known what you are. You have slumbered upon yourself. Okay, sleep is sort of a signifier for not fully understanding yourself. But if you're looking for something even more explicit, you have this first part before the comma, you have not known what you are. You do not understand yourself, okay, is essentially what he's saying. And when you take into account perspective, when he says you have not known what you are, he is saying you have not fully understood yourself. Okay, so A is perfect there. Let's go ahead and talk about B, C, and D as well. Okay, so we have option B. These immense meadows, these interminable rivers, you are immense and interminable as they. Well, him calling the reader, in that case is us, because we are the reader here, immense is not stating that we have not fully understood ourselves. So we can get rid of B, that is not illustrating the claim. If we take a look at C, I should have made my way straight to you long ago. I should have blabbed nothing but you. I should have chanted nothing but you. Once again, that is not showing that, or is not illustrating that we have not fully understood ourselves. So we can get rid of C. Okay, now we get into D. And D is where perspective really comes into play. Okay, option D states, I will leave all and come and make hymns of you. None has understood you, but I understand you. So what many people will do here is they will see none has understood you, and they will translate that into thinking that D has to be the answer. Because if we scroll up, the claim is that Whitman's suggesting to the readers, who he's addressing directly, that they have not fully understood themselves. But this is where perspective comes into play. If I say to you, my viewer right now, no one has understood you, would you interpret that to mean that you yourself have not understood you? Probably not, okay? If someone says to me, no one has understood you, Hayden, I would not interpret that to mean that I myself have not understood myself, okay? So this is where perspective comes into play. Because he is addressing us directly, we need to recognize and interpret this as no one has understood you. That is not the same as saying that you have not understood yourself because of the perspective here. Okay, so that is the problem with answer choice D. Okay, D is stating, I will leave all and come and make the hymns of you. None has understood you, but I understand you. Okay, so ultimately we can get rid of D. We see our answer has to be answer choice A. Here's how I recommend you approach questions on the digital SAT reading section that ask you to use data from either a table, graph, or any sort to support or weaken any sort of claim or hypothesis or conclusion. Okay, so I'm gonna illustrate this with question number 15. The way I would start is I'd start by reading through the passage. So I have Alicia Monte Sinos Navarro, Isabel Storer, and Rocio Perez Barrales recently examined several plots within a diverse plant community in Southeast Spain. The researchers calculated that if individual plants were randomly distributed on this particular landscape, only about 15% would be with other plants and patches of vegetation. So one thing that will jump out to me here is the fact that it's randomly distributed. Okay, anytime that I see something's randomly distributed, I'm usually gonna pay attention to it. Um, that goes for the reading section as well as the math section actually. Um, but we'll keep reading. They counted the number of juvenile plants of five species growing in patches of vegetation and the number growing alone on bare ground and compared those numbers to what would be expected if the plants were randomly distributed, Okay, which we obviously have up there. Based on these results, they claim that plants of these species that grow in close proximity to other plants gain an advantage at an early developmental stage. So here we have a claim. Okay, anytime we have a claim, hypothesis, conclusion, anything along those lines, I will always mark it. Okay, because that makes it easier for me to come back and find it later. So which choice best describes data from the table that supports the claim? So we're looking to support this claim. 
if we take a look at the table now, and that is what I will do, okay, before going to the answer choices, I will actually go back to the table. Now, I will note that this is a case where it can be somewhat of a personal preference for me personally. I would prefer to go back to the table, find what data is supporting this claim, and then look through the answer choices. For some people, they may want to go straight to the answer choices. I would recommend that you go to the claim or go from the, after reading the claim and after reading the prompt, going to the table. I just find that it makes it easier to avoid getting misled by some of the answer choices, but um, you know, you can kind of make your own decision there. So let's go ahead and go through this. So we've got to support the claim that species that grow in close proximity gain an advantage on early developmental stage. We have juvenile plants found growing on bare ground and in patches of vegetation for five species. We got the five species, we got the number found in bare ground, found in patches of vegetation. We got the total, we got the percent found in patches of vegetation. Now, one thing that we need to keep in mind here is that if they were randomly distributed, we'd expect that 15% would be with other plants in patches of vegetation. So we would expect that the percent found in patches of vegetation would be 15%. Okay, so 15%. And that's for individual plants. So it doesn't give a, a name on the species. So I would just expect 50% in all of these then, 15%. As we can see, we don't have that. We'd have above 50% in all of them, which is more than three times what would be expected. Okay, so that's really the evidence I'm looking for is pretty much stating um, pretty much all of this column of this table um, is obviously more than three times what was expected. So let's go down and look at our options. Okay, so we have option A. For all five species, less than 75% of juvenile plants were growing in patches of vegetation. Well, that is not supporting the claim. Okay, so we can get rid of A. We need to focus on the fact that it's three times what would be expected compared to random distribution. We've got B, the species with the greatest number of juvenile plants growing was H. Stowe. Stowe. Okay, we don't really care um, about one particular species versus the other. Okay, we used five species if we look back up at our text, but we're not really concerned with a comparison of the species. Okay. So we've got option C, we got for T libanites and T moradero, the percentage of juvenile plants growing in patches of vegetation was less than what would be expected if plants were randomly distributed. Well, we actually see that it's more than what would be expected if plants were randomly distributed. So this would fall into the bucket of wrong answer choices that is um, the incorrect, um, I guess in this case, it's a, a misinterpretation, okay? Because it's actually stating, it's really just misinterpreting the data. It's stating that it's a less than what would be expected, but it's actually more, okay? So this would just be a misinterpretation of the data. We've got option D now. For each species, the percentage of juvenile plants growing in patches of vegetation was substantially higher than what would be expected if the plants were randomly distributed. Okay, we see that that's true according to the data. Okay, as you can see, by going back to the table first and finding what data from the table would support that claim, Okay, I was able to have an idea of what I'm looking for before going into the answer choices. Here's a second example of how I recommend that you approach questions on the digital SAT reading section that ask you to use data for some reason, whether that's to support or weaken some sort of claim, or in this case, to complete an example. So first thing I would take a look at is the prompt. Okay, we've already gone over that. So from here, instead of going straight to the data, I'm gonna go ahead and go to where I have my passage. So we have some researchers studying indigenous actors and filmmakers in the United States have turned their attention to the early days of cinema, particularly the 1910s and 1920s, when people like James Young Deer, Dark Cloud, Edwin Carre, Lillian St. Cyr, known professionally as Red Wing, were involved in one way or another with numerous films. In fact, so many films and associated records of this era have been lost that counts of those four figures' outputs should be taken as bare minimums rather than totals. It's entirely possible, for example, that, okay, we have four example, so we need to discuss what we're getting an example of. Well, ultimately, we state that um, so many films and associated records have been lost that counts for these figures' outputs should be taken as bare minimums rather than, to rather than totals. It's entirely possible, for example, that blank. Okay, so we'd be looking to discuss how um, it looks like in our table, we've got number of films known and commonly credited. And then we have years active in the individual credited, credited film output. Keep in mind, since this is the credited film output, we've discussed how that's a bare minimum, not a total. And then we're stating it's entirely possible, okay, since we're saying it's possible that um, these are bare, since these are bare minimums, it would be possible that our numbers would be higher than what's in this table then, okay? So um, which choice effectively uses data to complete the example, okay? In this case, like on the last question, I prefer to go back to the ta data table, okay, and try to figure out how I can use that to, in this case, I need to complete the example. In the past example, it was supported claim. So to complete the example, it's much more difficult to actually come down with an idea of what you're looking for. But in this case, it um, looks like we're just gonna be looking for an example that provides greater numbers than what's in here for all these, for all these, uh, these rows because what's in these rows is really just to be bare minimums is what we're told, not the actual totals. So we've got option A, Dark Cloud acted in significantly fewer films than did St. Lillian, Lillian St. Cyr, who's credited with 66 performances. Well, that's not providing an example. Okay, keep in mind, we need to provide that example because that's what we're told. We've got B, Edwin Carriz, 
47 credited acting roles include only films made after 1934. Well, if we go up, we've got years active, 1912 to 1934 for Edwin Curray. Uh, his 47 acting roles include only films after 1934. Well, we've got 47 acting roles here. We see that that's from 1912 to 1934. So B is incorrect according to the data, so we can get rid of that. Okay, we can go down, we can look at option C. We have Lillian St. Cyr acted in far more than 66 films and Edwin Carey directed more than 58. So Lillian St. Cyr, we can find where she is. We have got 66 here. Okay, this is the amount that she's credited for. We know that we're looking for that being a bare minimum and that she actually did more than that. So this makes sense. Next, we have Edwin Carey directed more than 58. We see Edwin Carey uh, was credited as the director for 58. Once again, we're stating that he did more than that, which is in line with an example that these are bare minimums and not totals. Okay, so C looks perfect. We'll take a quick look as, at D as well. D states that James Young Deer actually directed 33 films and acted in only 10. Okay, we can find James Young Deer. We see that he's credited with 33, okay, and he's credited as the writer for uh, 10, so 33 actor and uh, writer for 10. Uh, so in this case, it's stating that he actually directed 33 films. Oh, okay, he's stated as the director for 35, so that'd be less than. So that is not an example. So that'd actually be the opposite of what we were looking for. So you could put that in the bucket of an opposite um, for the wrong answer choice, okay? So our answer would have to be answer choice C. Okay, so the key thing I want you to take away from these last two examples is you have a question like this where you're asked to use data for you know something or another on the SAT reading section that I recommend that you would approach it would be you start by taking a look at the prompt. From there, go to the passage. Once you're done with the passage, figure out what you need from the data. Go back to the data. Once you're done going back to the data, have an idea of what you're looking for in your answer choice to either support, weekend, whatever you need. Then go to your answer choices. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and consider sending a super thanks to help support my channel. Additionally, please drop a comment below letting me know what videos you want me to make in the future. And if you are looking for additional educational services that I offer, please check out my website, haydenrody.com.